For more than 30 years, appearing in such films as Four Weddings and a Funeral, The Phantom of the Opera, and Shakespeare in Love. He's also written several books, among them biographies of Orson Welles and Charles Dickens. His current project is Being Shakespeare. It is a one-man show which tells the story of William Shakespeare's life, drawing on passages from his plays. It is showing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music until April 14th. I am pleased to have Simon Callow back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Tell me about being Shakespeare. W where does it come from? Why do you want to do this? And, and what's the magic of it all? Well, of course, we're utterly fascinated to know who it was who created this staggering body of plays, yes. this amazing invention of language, this invention of the theatre, this, this central figure in our lives. Whether we ever go to see a play or not, we're influenced by William Shakespeare. His words will be on our lips, whether we know it or not. He coined thousands of words which are in everyday circulation. And when we talk, talk about love, we're really talking about Romeo and Juliet. We're influenced by his vision of love and so on. But we know, really frankly, almost nothing about the inner life of this man. We know a lot about his outer life. We know all the important things. We know who his mother and father were, yeah. where, where he was born, uh, how many brothers and sisters he had, how many, when he married, how many children, and so on. Yeah. Interesting stuff. But not revealing stuff. We don't have a letter from him. We don't have a diary entry from him. He never did an interview, for example, which would have been very illuminating if he had. Yeah. So we want to know, we have to, we feel, I think it's very human of us to just want to know who was the guy who yeah. created all this. And so what do you do? We, you, you take the bits that you know, yeah. you find out something about his life, about the times in which he lived, about the Elizabethan age and all of that. And what we've tried to do in this play, this kind of biographical journey into Shakespeare, this exploration, this quest, is we've taken as a spine his great speech, All right. the World's a Stage, right. from As You Like It, which is an account of a human life. And we ask ourselves, what was it like to be an Elizabethan baby? What was it like to be an Elizabethan schoolboy yeah. or an Elizabethan soldier, etc., etc., etc.? The first age is the infant, the second age is the schoolboy, the third age is the lover, the fourth age is the soldier, the fifth age is the justice, and the sixth age is old age. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, and, and the seventh age is dementia. The seventh age is dementia. Yeah, is yeah. Alzheimer's, of which he gives the most brilliant account, just as he seems to have given the greatest account of what it is to be human in yeah. every area of life. He's anticipated in some extraordinary way what we are now all so familiar with, which is the horror of Alzheimer's and the dread of dementia. There it is, in King Lear, clinically laid out and for us. And you know this personally. Well, I know it from my own. My mother has, has had Alzheimer's for six years. Uh, yeah. She hasn't known who I am for the last four of them. Uh, and uh, I've seen it all absolutely, the whole journey, exactly as described by William Shakespeare 500 years ago. He understood what it meant. <clears throat> he understood. That age of man and yeah. woman. But everything. It's a mo most uh, unnerving thing. And as an actor, you're very aware that his account of his characters is completely organic. It doesn't seem to have been uh, created by excessive intellectual uh, uh, endeavor. It seems that he's put his finger on the pulse of all these individual human beings and just allowed their blood to throw, flow through his veins. It's an extraordinary sensation as an actor. If you trust the part as he wrote it, you don't have to play the part at all. The part will play you. And it's thrilling to surrender to the life in the writing. Most extraordinary. And is that what is required to, 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 do, to do Shakespeare well, to surrender to it? Yeah. It has a, a certain form, which is it is in certain rhythms, and there's, there's a shape to the phrases, and you interfere with that at your peril, but basically you open yourself up to it. You allow it to take you over. And when it does, it's, it's, it's just exactly like having a, somebody else's life flow through you. It's quite extraordinary. And you find yourself, I find myself, dangerously moved by what happens, by, by the, the naturalness, the, the simplicity of so much of it. There's a, there's a little scene in um, uh, A Winter's Tale when young Prince Mamilius is trying to entertain his mother. And uh, she, her language is so simple, but it, it's as if it, you've just overheard it next door a second. Come on, sit down. Come on and do your best to fright me with your sprites. She says, you're powerful at it. It's any mother talking to her child at any time in human history. It's absolutely exquisite. It's, it's astonishing. It's uh, unaccountable, we, actually. We have on videotape all the world's a stage. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. 
They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. He might have been speaking for his author. That's certainly how William Shakespeare saw the world. And then Jaquies adds, his acts being seven ages, a human life. At first, the infant, kneeling and puking in the nurse's arms. Even if you grow up to be William Shakespeare, you still start like every other baby, mewling and puking. Put that in context and, and, and give me your own best. Well, what basically, uh, um, it, it, it comes out of, it's a speech by Jaques, the courtier right, right. of the old duke who's in exile in the forest. And the duke makes a remarkable observation. Young man, Orlando, comes in, he's uh, 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 in d deep distress, and uh, he's frightened and angry and aggressive, and the Duke calms him down, and the boy goes off to fetch this old servant that he's yeah. been carrying through the, uh, the, the, the forest with him, and the Duke says to his courtiers, Thou seest we are not all alone unhappy. That phrase in itself is astonishing. That's what the theatre's all about. Thou seest we are not all alone, unhappy. We're all in this together. We all know what it is to be human. And then he says, this wide and universal theatre presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. We're all in it. Again, he's saying that same thing. And Jaquiz chips in and says, all the world's a stage. And all the men and women, merely players, they have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. And what I observe in the show is that is exactly how Shakespeare saw the world. Shakespeare saw the world as a wide and universal theatre, and we're all playing parts. And they, they change as we get older. Uh, uh, we're all putting on disguises. We're all uh, um, uh, 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 offering asides to the audience in our life. We're all basically actors. Uh, he was an actor himself, uh, um, uh, an actor of... of, of uh, modest accomplishment and modest ambition. He only played small parts, as far as we're aware. Uh, in my view, because if he'd played anything like Hamlet or Othello, he would have unhinged himself. The I intensity of the emotion as it passed through him would have just uh, uh, um, uh, created a, a sort of nervous breakdown. So he held himself back from the, those kind of intensities. Uh, I want to have you talk about these ages. I mean, uh, at first, the infant. Yeah. Mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Yeah, it's pretty vivid, isn't it? Mewling yeah. and puking, throwing up. Uh, um, and uh, there's an interesting example of a word that he invented. Puking was invented by William Shakespeare. And it's yeah. such a vivid word, it, it could only yeah. mean something as sh short and violent as, as throwing up like that. Yeah. And, and no sentimentality, you see. Yeah. Mewling, m moaning and... and puking in yeah. the nurse's arms. And that's all he tells us about the, uh, the, 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 uh, what it is to be an infant. Uh, and then he moves on to the, the whining schoolboy. Yeah. Again, so vivid. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining Shine. morning face. That's right. Creeping, creeping like, like snail, snail unwillingly willing. to school. You know? I mean, that's, isn't that every child you've seen uh, yeah. on, on their way to school? He went to grammar school where he taught Latin grammar? Yeah, well, that's... One of the things we're trying to do, as I said, we're trying to investigate what every person in Elizabethan England experienced, yeah. and then, obviously, he would have experienced that to some extent himself. And what's fascinating is the kind of education that he got in a grammar school. There was a grammar school in Stratford-on-Avon. They were springing up all over the country. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a new move by the Tudor establishment. They wanted mm. to train up a class of... Mm. Uh, um, lawyers and clerks and politicians, the sort of mainstays of the Elizabethan state. So they were training them up, and the way they trained them was to teach them rhetoric, which is the art of uh, argument, basically, of organizing your thoughts, right, right. marshalling your arguments, and so on. And it was a very strict discipline, which had very particular uh, uh, codes and uh, practices and, and a vocabulary all of its own. But that's exactly how Shakespeare was, was taught. He didn't study anything else, you know, in that grammar school. They didn't study history, and they didn't study geography. They didn't study mathematics. They didn't study science. They just studied 
rhetoric, rhetoric. language, the, the many different ways to say things. And what better training could you have for a writer? But his education was truncated, wasn't it? When yeah, because his dad uh, fell into debt. Uh, his, his father's a very interesting figure. I, we, we know the, uh, bits and pieces about his father, but one of the important things is, of course, he was the mayor of Stratford. He was a person of some significance, uh -huh. uh, but then he ran in, got into terrible debt. Uh -huh. And then, worse than that, uh, he made loans to people charging excessive interest rates, which was the crime and sin of usury. Right. And he was thrown, booted off the local council and forbidden to access to the church. Now, that's an incredible thing. In the 16th century, he was banned from going to the church. He was a kind of pariah in Stratford-on-Avon. And we ask ourselves in the play, what does that do to a young man? If your father's such a, 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 a someone who's, who's shunned in the town, and the answer is he goes to London to make good. And once he gets to London, he finds that it's very hard to get a job, because and, it was. And then the third age is the lover, and then the lover. Yeah. Sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. That's right, yes. Witty. I mean, it's just so witty, isn't yeah. it? Uh, 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 he uh, marries uh, at what, 18? To he married at 18. Which was and she was older. She was 26. That's a big gap, isn't it? Yeah, especially that age. Absolutely. And, uh, in fact, he was, it was uh, very unusual uh, for a young man to get married. There are only three people in his whole area in 50 years who got married under the age of 20. And, of course, she was pregnant, too, mm. which uh, uh, was a pretty shocking thing in Elizabethan society. So the question is, uh, everybody wants to know about Shakespeare's wife and his relationship with her. Uh, uh, and the one thing everybody remembers about it is that in his will, he left her the second best bed. That's all. And everybody thinks, oh, well, that's uh, dismissive. He didn't care for her at all. On the contrary, that's the bed they would have slept in. Mm -hmm. That was the tradition. But it struck me, and it strikes Jonathan Bate, the author of the right. piece, that uh, it, well, this is a sexy relationship, a sexy older wife. And there in Stratford-on-Avon, I think, he learned about love yeah. from Anne, you know? Yeah. Three, three children. Three children, a, 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 a daughter first and then a son and a, a daughter twins. And, uh, of course, another thing there, a very critical thing, is that the boy died when he was 11 years old. So Shakespeare's only son and his heir died at that age, which uh, uh, is a shattering blow for anybody, any man. Uh, for Elizabethan, it was overwhelming because he, he only had daughters then. And from their point of view, that was... You know, mm. that he'd lost, you know, who, who did he have to, to pass on all his money and all his considerable uh, 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 property and so on by then. Uh, and so that must inform uh, the whole idea. Of the, the name, boy's name, interestingly, was Hamnet. Hamnet. Yeah, and he died just before Shakespeare wrote yeah. uh, Hamnet. So it can only be echoing all the way through that play. I shouldn't be reading these, you should, but the fourth age is the shoulder, <laughs> is the soldier, soldier. Fourth age is the soldier, then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. In the cannon's mouth, look, look at that, with what we see every day from our from war zones, the terrible yeah. scenes of these young men, these young men who go to war eagerly, seeking the bubble reputation, Right. even in the cannon's mouth. They go right up to the cannon, they offer themselves to death. Uh, uh, it, it's an incredibly somber thought. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, it, nowadays, I, I find that section, there's a whole section about soldiering and the war, and a great kind of so sober feeling descends on the audience when I talk about those things because we know the reality of it. It was a present reality for them because the Elizabethans were never not at war. Mm -hmm. And there was an insatiable demand for men. There could never be enough soldiers. Recruiting officers roamed the land all the time trying to whip people. And Ben Jonson, Shakespeare's contemporary, fought in the Netherlands. We don't know whether Shakespeare did or not. He could well have done. It's perfectly possible. Yeah. Uh, the fifth age is the justice, and then the justice in fair round belly with good captain line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so. He plays his part. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, a, isn't that a brilliant little, little, yeah. little snapshot of, the, of a justice of the peace? That's what he's really talking about. But justice yeah. itself is right at the heart of Shakespeare's plays. And he, he actually was involved in lots of law cases himself, mostly to do with property.
Yeah. He, he, uh, uh, he and, and very unsuccessfully too. He kept on losing them, and uh, uh, and the property law was incredibly unfair in Elizabethan England. Almost nobody came out of it with anything, and uh, uh, so his rather bitter feelings about lawyers are evidenced throughout the place. It's a famous famous line of Dick the Butcher in King Henry the Sixth. Yes. He says, "The first thing we do, let's kill all, all the lawyers." lawyers. <laughs> it's always a, a popular which sentiment, which is often repeated. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and the Six Age was old. Age, the six age shifts into the lean and slippered pantalon, pantaloon, with spectacles on, with spectacles on nose and pouch, pouch on the side. side. Yes, yeah. his big that's manly voice yeah. turning again. It's it's that's what we you know that that's just age, uh, which we you know comes to us all and we see it all around us. But it's kind of benevolent in a sense. But age in Shakespeare's plays is often a thing regarded with contempt. Um, and uh, there's a very famous section, of course, in Henry IV, when King Henry V, the newly crowned King Henry V, rejects Falstaff, uh, his playmate. Uh, um, he's grown out of him. And he says, how ill white hairs become a fool and jester. And he talks about, I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. There's a, there's a feeling of great bitterness and rejection of the old. Shakespeare, you know, was only 52 when, when he died. died. But uh, we, m I think, are not wrong to assume that he was uh, in poor physical condition when he died. And the famous portrait of him at the front of the, uh, the folio, the famous great edition of his plays, published after his death, of course, by his fellow actors, um, was uh, suggest to us that possibly he had syphilis. Mm. And that would account to a large extent for the terrible bitterness of so many of the plays of that period, of, of his, you know, uh, what would have been his mid-40s. Uh, but he fe himself feeling ancient. You wrote a book called Being an Actor. Yep. Yeah. In search of what in writing a book? Oh, well, Let's I, begin with a question, some people say. Uh, yes, well, I, what I wanted to tell people was what it was like to be an actor and what it was, what, 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 what the feeling, what we experience as actors, both on stage and in our lives and our careers. And I came to it with such freshness because I'd, I started acting a little bit later than some people do. I was 21 uh, when I went to uh, uh, drama school and I was 24 when I started acting. And I came upon the world of the theatre and the world of acting almost like an anthropologist discovering a lost tribe. I thought, yeah. how wonderful and extraordinary these people are, and now I'm one of them. How extraordinary our rituals are how remarkable the experience we have is. And it's been a lifelong study. I, I still am profoundly fascinated by the nature of acting. Can you describe your own acting style? <laughs> That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it's a very um, sensual, very uh, um, physical. It, I, I like to make hope that I'm making a strong physical impact. I, I've always had a lot of energy and uh, I've had a lot of invention and imagination and I've found that uh, exciting. Uh, Mark, you, as I get older, I move away from that more I know, and, more. and I want to know why. Well, I've come to a conclusion in the last couple of years. I, I've suddenly realised what I think acting is. And it's a very simple thing. Uh, uh, acting is thinking the thoughts of another person. One, thinking the thoughts of another person. Yeah. Well, once you do that, once you adopt the mental patterns of another person, and that's what the writer gives yeah. you, then everything else follows. Emotion and your physical life follow on from then. So, for me, it's much less to do with having an idea about the way I want to look or having an idea about the way I want to walk. It's about actually starting to think those thoughts, that those words are mine. They come from me. And then uh, I, I'll, I'll change. My physical life changes and my, my, my emotional life changes utterly. And so in this play, where I play 23, 24 people, right. uh, I'm absolutely the victim. As long as I get the thought 
straight down the line, as, as long as I'm absolutely thinking it at the second. So how do you get to do that? I mean, if the crucial thing is to think the thoughts yeah. of the character, yeah. how do you get there? Well, basically, you have to know them first. So you've really got to master the text completely so that you can... Because the great art of, of, of acting, which many people want to know how you learn the lines is, yeah. uh, uh, and the answer to that is by forgetting everything else. But, uh, but wait, wait, stop. Forgetting everything else. Yeah, clear what? your mind out completely of anything else that might be in it. Any mm. of your daily concerns, right, right, anything right, else. Right. Blank sheet, and then you put down these thoughts. It's almost like creating a new file on yeah. the computer. You put in all those thoughts on that page. But the actual question is not how, how do you learn the lines, but how do you forget them? How do you appear to have forgotten them? Because you so have that you make it natural yes. as you've just had the thought. You have to surprise yourself yeah. with your own thought. And only then will it be in the present. And that's the great thing about acting. And the function of acting, in my view, is to bring everybody into the present. We walk it around mostly locked in the past or worrying about the future. What the theatre can do for you is to bring you into the present moment. It's sort of zen-like. You're there with those people, you're following it, nothing else in the world matters to you except the lives of those people. And then you become, you, it makes you very alive. Now, does this make sense? I think it was Bill Nye who said this to me. Uh, the key to acting is to make it appear as you have just had the thought. It's exactly right. It's the mental energy that is the thing that produces all the excitement in the theatre. And the greatest mm -hmm. actors are the ones who have the, the, are most directly connected to the impulses in their brain. So someone like Maggie Smith uh, yeah. is, is uh, above all, she, as she I says the God, thought, yeah. as she says the word, the image comes into your mind, into her mind and into your mind. It brings to life. It's not, words aren't just counters. They are, they're, they're, they're filled with meaning. And it's the meaning that we have to connect to. It's almost as if um, the, 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 the text was a, a film passing through your mind, and your mind was the light yeah. that illuminates it. So as it hits the frame, suddenly you see an image. That's uh, what it's about. You said, uh, while it started as a type of escape, it has now become the exact opposite, in that I'm actually trying to connect to the center of myself rather than creating a periphery. Yeah, that's exactly it. I did, uh, when I, when I uh, started acting, uh, I, I hated myself, you know, lots of actors do, uh, and uh, I wanted to escape into another face, right. another body, right. Right. Uh, another life. Uh, and that, you know, kept me going yeah. for quite a long time. But then, of course, I started living. Now, does this have anything to do with your own, you know, understanding of your own sexuality? I don't think so. No, mm. not particularly. I was, I was you always were one of the earliest actors to come out, as I remember, I like believe, in 1984. Or something. Yes, yeah. I was, uh, and uh, I, I, it always. I, I, it, I never had a, a problem with admitting right, right, my right, sexuality. Right, right. I was lucky that so, I came from... So you didn't need any kind of escape to go to? No. Yeah. It wasn't to do with that at all. It was rather more profound than that. It was to do with a, a sense of alienation, which was more to do with who I was, my personality, rather than with my, my sexuality. Yeah. That wasn't the issue. Um, what but, did you uh, like about your personality? I just felt I was in some peculiar way, which I can't even properly explain to you, and I think many actors feel this, I just felt I didn't belong inside my own body, I didn't belong inside my own life, I didn't belong inside my own family, I didn't belong anywhere. And in some inexplicable way, when I started standing up on stage in front of other people, I suddenly thought, ah, I belong now, now, I am, now I'm where I should and be. And when did you know that? Well, when I stood on stage for the first time, Which and not was? until then. Oh, that was very late. Very late. I didn't do any school plays or anything like that. I went to university yeah. uh, in order to act for no other reason. And I stood on stage, and uh, I, I felt a t two completely conflicting things. One w which was, God, it's wonderful to be here. And the other was, how terrible I am. And so I get out of university as quick as I could, and I went to drama school. And I went to the toughest drama school in the world, a school called the Drama Center. And uh, Michael Fassbender is oh, yes, the yes, youngest yes, right. and the most brilliant graduate from that school. And it's like the Marines. It's like, you know, our motto of that drama school should have been, who dares wins. It's just... Uh, a terrible crash course in uh, getting rid of all the nonsense and the masks and the pretenses that you we all. And if, if you can accumulate. survive that, then you are an actor. That 
It was my experience, yes. Uh, other people had a much easier time of it, but the, the, I took it very much to heart. I, I thought, you know, I didn't know at all whether I could act, and so I was prepared to do anything yeah. at all to discover whether I had it in me. Yeah, but the love of Shakespeare came much earlier. Much earlier, yes. That came, that started almost romantically, as I might say, with the mother of the headmistress of a school where my mother was the school secretary my right. education was thrown in as part of uh, yeah. her salary right and this wonderful hairy bosom bosom right. uh, enhanced woman uh, 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 mrs. Birch uh, um, t t sat me on her lap and we listened together I was six years old at the time to Macbeth on the radio and Macbeth. yeah and I was just overwhelmed with the, the the power of the images of course I didn't understand what was being said but the radio production was very vivid people fighting on battlements witches yeah. dead men walking forests on the move I was thrilled and hooked completely and then but it took you a while to know that you had to be an actor yep I didn't necessarily associate these things. I, I, just, I fell in love with language. I right. fell in love right. with... I was stage-struck, is what it was. Yeah. And it's not necessary that when you're stage-struck, you then want to become an actor. Yeah. It wasn't till I wrote to Laurence Olivier and, and, an admiring letter about his work at the National Theatre, and he wrote back to me and said, if you like it so much, why don't you come and work here? Now, what was it in that letter that made it so persuasive for him? He knew that I was just in love with the theatre. Yeah. It, uh, it was three full-scap pages of closely typed yeah. letter explaining to Laurence Olivier what a wonderful theatre he was running. But I think, think it's amazing that he read the letter. Yeah. I mean, somebody probably read it and said, you have to see this, this is the real thing. Yeah, yeah, I probably. suppose. I suppose. You know, I don't know. And I think I might have ended up with the phrase, it makes one proud to be British, which was the kind of phrase that Laurence Olivier was very stirred by. He was a very simple patriot, Laurence Olivier, and it may have been that, or maybe something else in the letter. Or maybe he thought, I got it. I really got what he was trying to do. So he invited you to come? To come and work in the box office. As what? Box office assistant. Yes. Number three, box office assistant. A very lowly figure, I may tell yeah. you. Uh, and But it was it, that was the... Then I knew that the theatre was where I belonged, in whatever capacity. But then I met actors for the first time. Like Gilgood. Uh, no, I had never met... He was working there. Uh, and, of course, I did meet Olivia. But the important ones for me were the young actors. Oh. Derek Jacobi, oh, Michael yeah. Gambon, yeah. Jane Lapiter, all those wonderful young actors. And they were like me you know they were ordinary people they weren't grandees Maggie Smith was a bit you know like that and Laurence Olivier was a bit like that but these were just chaps and girls yeah. you know that uh, like me and so I thought maybe maybe I could become an actor too yeah. if they're like me or if I'm like them then maybe I could become an actor that's it exactly exactly so yeah. then then in a terrible act of Les Majesté one night as the theatre happened to be dark. I leapt up onto the stage of the old Vic and I said, to be or not to be, that is the question. And I happened to stand on the spot on the stage, which was the perfect acoustic spot, and the words echoed back at me like the voice of God. Yeah. And I, I ran for my life, but I, but I think something ran happened. Ran for your there. life? Yeah, I did. I was a bit frightened, but it was a very powerful moment. Yeah. Sometimes you can experience on the stage remarkable power. It surges through you, and it's sort of bigger than you. And of course, when you get it right, it's always bigger yeah. than you. It's it's access to something sublime, is the yeah. truth. What are some of the favorite lines from the sonnets for you? There's a wonderful... Many of the poems are about time, but I love the, the one that starts, Like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end, each changing place with that which went before, in sequent toil, all forwards to contend. Nativity, once in the main of light, crawls to maturity, wherewith, being crowned, crooked eclipses against his glory fight, and time which gave doth now his gift confound. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Being Shakespeare is at BAM from April 4th till April 14th, correct? Oh, uh, what a great thing to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Simon Callow, being Shakespeare at the Brooklyn Academy of Music from April 4th to April 14th. If you thought this was interesting, you ain't seen nothing. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. See you next time.